morning. Good morning. Brothers and sisters, this is the last Sunday uh, after the Epiphany of our Lord. It's also called Transfiguration Sunday. And uh, what I want you to think about is this. Throughout uh, the, the time of Epiphany, we have had a sort of progressive revelation of a little bit more each Sunday about the glory and the power and what kind of a being this is uh, that has come into the world who was born of, of Mary. Today we get the, the highest glimpse. Uh, it's actually a glimpse beyond the resurrection to the glory of, uh, uh, of Jesus. It is, it is a beautiful picture. Now, when you look at this, um, uh, our reading today from the gospel lesson, it says that, that Jesus was transfigured and cloud and the voice. And then everything disappears, and it's just Jesus again. And like the sense of it is, not the sense of the text, but the way we read it is, then everything went back to, to normal. Everything went back to reality. We had this vision, and now we go back to reality. But I would submit to you that the reality was what we call the vision. Okay, which is misbehaving over here, something horrible. Uh, the reality, what we call reality, uh, is what Paul says, now we see through a glass dimly, okay? We don't see things the way they really are. The way things really are are hidden from us. Paul uses the word a veil today. There's a veil before the faces of unbelievers. They cannot really see. But we're going to see that God has revealed some beautiful things to them. Which one is it? Which one is that? This is actually all part of the transfiguration ritual. <laughs> now, so this is the one that's misbehaving, and you're fired. Okay. Yes, for centuries, uh, pastors did this on transfiguration. They had no idea what they were doing or why, and eventually we did develop these sound things that now we know. Okay, well, people of God, this is also our last Sunday to have what has been our, our this beautiful divine service, third setting service. Next Sunday will be the first Sunday uh, in Lent, and we'll have divine service fourth setting then. Uh, right now, of course, we have Ash Wednesday scheduled for this coming Wednesday. Whether that will happen or not, uh, the Lord has a say in that, so we'll see. Um, at any rate, we are here now. It's cold outside. It's warm in here, and the Lord is with us because where two or three are gathered, he is always in our midst. So let's rise and let's go and worship our Lord.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching Him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, Amen. who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful me. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us, and has given His only Son to die for us, and for His sake, he forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has bestowed on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. From Psalm 99. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the therapy. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he.
be with you. And also with you. We pray together now our colic for today. O oh God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in His glory and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated now for the reading of God's Word. Today's first lesson is from Exodus 34, beginning with verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, with the two tablets of testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is taken from 2 Corinthians 3, 12 and 13 uh, and 4, 1 to 6. Since we have such hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze on the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Therefore, have mercy, having this ministry by the grace of God, we do not lose heart but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We've refused to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience of the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of their world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants of Jesus' sake, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. <laughs> Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. 
And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. And now we join together and confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We'll sing hymn number 413, O Wondrous Type, O Vision Fair.
Jesus, the glory of the Father. Amen. A lot of talk in our world about religion. Sometimes I say that I don't like the word religion, and I don't. And the reason I don't like the word religion is because different people mean different things by it, and what most people mean by it I would not consider to be a very good definition of religion at all. But we're going to talk about religion. We're going to get it right, what it is that we're actually talking about or should be talking about. And I want you to bear this in mind. When you're talking to your neighbors or other people and you're talking about whether you're religious or not or they're religious or not or whether it's good to be religious or not, I want you to bear these things in mind, what you really are saying here and what really matters. All right, first, what people typically mean when they, mean, when they talk about religion. What they mean is we're talking about something pertaining to a deity, okay? Something relating to God. Now, there's a number of problems with this. Number one is that there are lots of things that we do in this world that somebody might not think directly pertains to God. What we're doing right now directly pertains to God. I think most people would realize that they'd say, well, this is religious. But showing up to work on time and working hard or taking care of your family, these are things that you know just people do. And, and they may not consider that to, to be a religious thing at all. And yet, it really is. It is a deeply religious thing, even though it doesn't necessarily look like it pertains to God. There's also this problem with that definition that we're always talking about God and pertaining to God. And that's this. Do you have to believe in God to be religious? See, some people think, well, you know, there's religious people and then there's people that don't believe in God. But you know, there are lots of folks who don't believe in God that are very, very religious. They, they prance around through the woods and hug trees and all that kind of stuff. And they're very, very, and they're talking about Mother Earth and all of this kind of stuff. There are people that believe that God is not a personal God, just sort of a force holding together the universe, the life force, you know, something like that. Not God like what you and I would recognize at all, but they also can be deeply religious. And then there are folks who believe in lots of gods, and they're offering sacrifices of this one and that one and another one, but no one particular God. And you might have to ask, if you have lots of gods, do you really have any God at all? I mean, sort of the nature of what God is, is that God is the one and the only. And so if you've got lots of gods, I don't know that you have God at all. And then you have people who don't believe that there's a God out there at all. They just believe that the universe just sort of incredibly has this power in and of itself and generates life by itself and is the thing which these people find at the heart of their religion. They worship the power and majesty of what you and I would call natural law or, the, or, or that sort of thing. The truth of the matter is, this is what I want you to understand, it is not possible to be a human being and not be religious. You may not have a very well-considered religion. You may not know what your religion is or be able to articulate it very well. But you cannot be a breathing, thinking human being and not ponder great questions about what it all means and, and what, what really is out there, if anything. And the person who says, when I look up at the stars, all I see is gases and empty space because that's all there is. That is a deeply religious, a terribly, terribly depressing, but deeply religious statement about the nature of reality. And their reality doesn't have a God in it. But other people look out there and they say, I worship the stars themselves. I see them as deities. And they are also very, very religious, but a very different religion. Here's the thing. When we're talking about religion, what we're really talking about is reality, what we think is real, okay? Do I think what is real is only what I can see and touch, only what I can measure? Well then, that's my, that's my understanding of reality, and, 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 and that for me is my religion. And I'm not going to have things in my life that pertain to a deity because I don't believe in a deity. But I do have a very deeply felt belief in what the nature of things are and what they mean. 
And I may very well believe that the nature of things is it's just all dust swirling around and one day I'll go back to dust too, but in the meantime, I'm going to have as good a time as I can. Religion is about reality, what we think reality is. Now, different people have different concepts of this. For the totally confused, and there are a lot of people in our culture today that are totally confused. For them, religion is reality, whether they know it or not. And what is real, they don't know. Okay, they just don't know. Is there a God out there? Yes, no, maybe. Well, there's no God out there, so what does it mean? Well, I really don't know what it means. If anything, maybe it doesn't mean anything at all. Or maybe there's lots of gods or whatnot. Their reality can be very confused because they don't know what's out there. Because folks, just looking around with your eyes, you can't tell what is real. Do you understand that? You can't. All you know is how you perceive things. You don't know what's real and what's not. So if you're totally confused and you have no idea what's real, then your religion is totally confused because your reality is totally confused. And there's no way out of that unless you have a little bit of reason. If you have a little bit of reason and rationality to you, then you're going to know that religion is reality and reality starts with God. Now, all you need to get here, all you need to understand this is just rationality, common sense. You can look around and see this just didn't create itself. And that if there's no God, there's no meaning or purpose to anything, in which case there's no reason even for me to be asking these questions. The reality is, the reality is, reality is about God. What God has done, what God likes, what God does not like, and what not like that. Now, you may not know what God likes, you may not know what he's done, but the reality is, if there is a reality, then it starts with God. And if there is no God, there is no reality, and this is all a figment of our imagination. So, all you need for that is just to be modestly reasonable. Because God has wired us this way. By nature, human beings know that there's a God out there. By nature, we just know this. Now, throughout the ages, we've become terribly, terribly confused. That's true, and often people deny things that are pretty obvious. But when you look up at the stars, you're not looking at God's. When you're looking up at the stars, you're not looking at vast emptiness. When you are looking at the stars, you are seeing a powerful evidence that a being ever so much greater than anything you and I can conceive of is behind it all. And you and I should quake at that thought. All right, let's talk about reality then. Since we're, we're not going to stop, we're not going to talk about religion anymore. We're going to talk about reality, okay? Because that's what religion is. It's what's real and the implications of that. So reality, 101, three really important words. Number one, the fear of God. Reality begins with the fear of God. The fear of God, the name of God, and the glory of God. Now, this is an elemental primer on reality. You want to know what's real? The fear of God, the name of God, and the glory of God. That's reality. If somebody says, well, not everybody believes that. Yeah, I know, not everybody believes in reality. I don't care. This is real. I'm not telling you what I believe, but you believe that. I'm telling you what is. That the God who said, let there be, is to be feared and has revealed his name and whose glory will take your breath and my breath away. So reality begins with the fear of God, the name of God, and the glory of God. Let's put it another way. When we talk about the fear of God, we're talking about the relevance of God. It's a weak word. I don't know what else to say. Fear is a better word. But what I mean is that if you have any common sense at all, you know that the God who created all this is something you don't trifle with, you don't take for granted, you don't ignore. You will understand that the scope of God is not just something to be worshipped on a given day or worshipped in a given way, that the scope of this God, a God who created all things, 
sustains all things and is everywhere always and is absolutely unimaginably huge. Now, to understand even a little bit about what the nature of what an infinite, almighty God is like is to stand in abject fear of that being. What he opens, no one can close. What he closes, nobody can open. And that's why the scripture says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't have this, you don't have and will never have anything but emptiness, darkness, and confusion in your life. Okay? It starts with this. Nothing happened by itself. And if there is something to look at and it's real, that's proof enough that God exists because nothing exists without God. The fear of God to recognize the scope, the breadth, the depth of what we mean when we say God. The name of God gets at what we know about God. What we know about God's will, what we know about God's character. And here is an elemental truth. Unless God tells us, we don't know anything about God's will and we don't know anything about God's character. So when we talk about the name of God, what we're really talking about is what God has revealed about himself. Okay? God reveals himself for you and I just remain in infinite ignorance. So we can, just with our common sense, recognize that there is such a thing as God and he is massive, breathtakingly awesome, but we can't know anything about that God. But this God also has revealed himself and that revelation of God we call the name of God, his renown, his reputation, what this God is really like. And the name of God is tightly bound up with the Word of God, because the Word of God is how he reveals himself, okay? The fear of God is wired into us, wired into the universe. The name of God is revealed by the lips of God, or we simply don't know anything about this God who's created us all. And then finally, the glory of God. Fearing God is one thing. Knowing about God is infinitely more. But what that does is call you and me to something even higher and deeper and greater. And that is, we want to experience this God. Not just experience the fact that he moves and everything shakes, but I mean experience the presence of God, the intimacy of God. And that's what we talk about the glory of God is somehow or another connected with seeing God's face, being in God's presence. The glory of God recognizes sort of the, 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 the weighty, meaty center somehow like the essence we're not just talking about evidence of God we're not just talking about a message about God but somehow or another God is in this place when Moses stumbles upon the the uh, the uh, burning bush it's it's not it's not immediately the name of God that we're talking about because the first thing that God says is take off your shoes the place you are standing is holy because the glory of God is there. The temple was where the glory of God was. And so the glory of God is the presence. It's a deeper appreciation. You know, when Jesus says, two or three are gathered and there am I in your midst. Or when we receive the Lord's Supper, we are experiencing the glory of God in a way that simply learning about God and what his will is, it's deeper, it's more sublime. You have to know God to experience the glory of God. Okay, so these things stack one on top of the next. At any rate, this is religion reality 101. The fear of God, you don't have that, you don't have reality. The knowledge of God, you don't know who God is, you still don't have reality. And the glory of God is you are missing out on the deepest aspect of what reality is. Okay, now we have Moses and his veil. I thought I might take a moment to tell you the backstory to that veil because your text doesn't have it. Your text has Moses coming down off the mountain and so here's this, uh, his face is shining and, and so people are a little spooked and then he talks talk to them and puts a veil and it tells us that after that, whenever he would come out of the temple, he would have, or the tabernacle, his face would shine. But let's go to the backstory here because the backstory is just from the previous chapter. Uh, a part of it and part of it from earlier in this chapter and it's this Moses was on the mount on Mount Sinai and the people were down misbehaving <laughs> okay we'll find that out All right, Moses said he was up there to get he was up there to get by the way the second tablets uh, he had already come down found the people misbehaving broke the tablets went back up on the mountain and now he's going to come back down a second time but before he does this Moses says to God he says please show me your glory 
So I want to, I'm learning all kinds of things about you, but I want to see you as you are. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. I am. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. He's telling about his character and his will, and he's telling Moses, I'm going to show you more. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. You've asked to see my glory. You've wanted some kind of a direct connection to me. That can't happen. That can't happen. But I am going to reveal a deeper sense of my name. And we're going to see that while Moses did not fully experience God, he did experience the glory of God. This is what happened next. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, my presence will pass by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. So the glory of God is an awesome thing. I mean, we just can't survive it. We can imagine it. And God can give it to us in dosages. But our capacity to take the whole thing in is, well, let's face it, brothers and sisters, he's God, and we're not, and that's that. But God will grant to Moses a measure of what he asks, to experience God's presence in a measure. I will pass by, I will protect you, I will pass by. And that's what happens. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, this is the proclamation of his name, what happens next is God is going to tell us what he absolutely wants Moses and every one of us to know about his will and his character. This is what God says. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. That's what God says. We might call that the law and the gospel. The beauty of the mercy and steadfast love of God. But on the other hand, he just doesn't overlook sin. And we find out later that the same God who says, right here in this passage, that he forgives iniquity and transgression and sin, but doesn't let the guilty off clear is on the one hand seemingly contradictory and on the other hand at the heart of what God is all about. Okay? He wants and loves and wants to draw near us sinners and the scripture is the story of how a just and holy and glorious God allows sinners who have no business being there to draw near to him. So that happened. So Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock, and God passed by. You have this combination of God revealing his presence in glory and a deeper a, a revelation of his name, his character. But at the same time, Moses is being protected by this rock, and God allows him to see him partially, but not directly and full on. And after that, Moses' face shone. Before that, there was nothing about Moses' face shining. But after that, his face shone because it says he had been talking with God. So in other words, he'd been in the presence of God. And being in the presence of God, this, this, this glow sort of reflected the fact that, that he had been in the presence of the glory of God. And, and Paul makes the point that, that he covered over with a veil because the, the, the glow would slowly fade. And Moses didn't want people to see the fading nature of this glory. And much is made of this in the New Testament that the glory of Moses faded because it's similar to the glory of the Old Covenant. It faded, unlike the glory of what would follow it, which does not fade a different time that the Lord's glory appeared 
here on this earth a different way. According to John chapter 1, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. The coming of Jesus was a revelation of God's character, but also of the glory of God, the presence of God, that thing which is that draws us so deeply toward it that the love of God wants just to be there and the place by the way which characterizes the world to come in the world to come the central thing about the world to come folks is not oh mosquitoes won't bite in the world to come and we can eat whatever we want and never get fat in the world to come those are just sideshows child's play the chief thing in the world to come is the glory of God, which we will experience continually. And as full as finite creatures like you and I can ever experience it, we will see him, we will be with him, we will dwell with him, not by faith, but by sight. But it began here, when the Son of God came into this world and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and dwelt among us for a while. He still dwells among us. The glory of God still dwells among us. So what does the scripture say? Well, the scripture says this regarding the coming of the glory of God. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. It says, long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, including Moses, who was the greatest of the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Moses was great, but the son is infinitely greater. He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. The son was the instrument to create the entire world. The passage goes on. He, the son, who came into the world in these last days. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Which means that when you know Christ, you know God. When you see Christ, you see God. When you hear Jesus of Nazareth, you are hearing the voice of God. Not a messenger from God, but the thing itself. So Philip once asked Jesus, show us the Father. That'll be good enough for us. Show us the Father. And Jesus said, Philip, have you been with me all this time and you still don't know? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And do you remember what Thomas said? after Jesus appeared to him after his resurrection and he showed him the holes in his hand and his side. Do you remember what Thomas said? My Lord and my God. That's what Hebrews says. Paul says this. He talks about the gospel of the glory of Christ. This is right in our epistle lesson. The gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The gospel is the glory of Christ, okay? So when you are talking about the gospel, you are experiencing sort of the heart, the meat of Christ. Paul also says, he uses this wonderful expression that what is being revealed in the world today in the gospel is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we talked about confused religion. Confused religion is a confused reality 
because it doesn't recognize that the beginning and the ending of everything is God. And if you abandon God, there's no hope for you going anywhere. You're not going to find any truth anywhere. You're just going to spin round and round in circles. But with a measure of common sense and looking at the universe and recognizing what you're seeing there, you can at least get some kind of a foothold for your reality and your religion. It can at least bear some resemblance to what's actually going on out there because you will recognize that everything starts and finishes with God. You may not know anything about that God, but you know that whatever that God is and thinks and does, that is reality. And whatever reality there is, is rooted in that God. That is is reality 101. No God, no real understanding of reality. Now advanced reality. This is what it really is. And that is that religion is reality, like I told you. It's not just things pertaining to the deity or things that seem particular. It's everything you and I do. It is everything you and I know. Everything that exists is tied up in what? In God. Because without God, a thing doesn't exist. And you and I don't exist. And we have no meaning or reason or purpose to be here. Nothing to talk about without God. So all reality ultimately is theology. It's all about God. And God... To know God is only possible in Christ. That Christ is the face of God for you and for me. Jesus Christ is everything God wants us to know about him. And in Jesus Christ, we have everything we'll ever need to know about the God who created all things in an instant. Or the God who punishes, or the God who rewards, or the God who does this, or that, or the other thing. In Jesus Christ, we not only know the fullness of God, but we experience the fullness of God. Think about that when you come up here and you receive the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus. The real presence of the glory of God. And that is the highest reality. And that is the most profoundly, deeply religious thing. And that, for you and me, is the gift of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus, now and to life everlasting. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, there on that beautiful mountain, Peter, James, and John had their breath taken away as they were transported from the, the dimness of this present darkness to see the reality of what's really there, and that's the glory of God in Jesus. They were so transported that they didn't want to leave. And Peter said, let's build booths. Let's live here. Let's stay here. Let's never let this go away. And, you know, have you ever sat in church or been in prayer or otherwise just been captured with a sense that God is present and you never want it to go away? Let's sing this next hymn, which, is, uh, which talks about that. It's called, Tis Good Lord to Be Here. It's hymn number 414, and you can't have a Transfiguration Sunday without singing this one. <coughs>
stream we're about to finish but we don't want to finish without reminding you number one of the good word of the Lord and also this the presence of the Lord is with you also and it remains with you and so the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always Amen, Amen.